West Africa has become a region of intense geopolitical conflict. In the past few years, there have been a series of military coups, and some of these in countries like Burkina Faso and Mali have led to the rise of nationalist governments that have opposed the neo-colonial policies of the West, in particular of France. France colonized most of West Africa, and still today, France maintains control over much of the economies in these countries through the extraction of natural resources by French mining companies. And Paris also controls these countries' monetary sovereignty by imposing a currency on them called the CFA franc, which is a colonial currency going back to the time when these countries were French colonies. And under this arrangement, these countries in West Africa essentially have no control over their own monetary policy. So what we've seen in West Africa is a rise of popular movements supporting some of these military governments and asserting national sovereignty. And the most recent example of this was in late July, a pro-Western leader in Niger was overthrown and a new military government was declared. This government has cut ties with France and told Paris that it needs to take its troops out of the country, although the French government has refused to do so. It has asserted national control over its natural resources. And despite the fact that Niger and its neighbors in West Africa, Burkina Faso and Mali are extremely poor, the majority of their populations are in poverty. Despite that, the top export of these countries is gold and much of that gold is extracted by western corporations and the people of these countries don't benefit from the vast riches of their natural resources well what we're seeing is an attempt to change that and even western media outlets have been forced to admit that the military government in niger is very popular a study conducted by The Economist, which is a right-wing pro-Western media outlet, it is very biased in the interest of NATO and the Western powers. Even The Economist was forced to acknowledge that 78% of people in Niger support the nationalist policies of the military government, and 73% of people in Niger want the military government to stay in power. Whereas just one quarter, just 27% of people in Niger want the pro-Western leader, Mohamed Bazoum, to be put back in power. We have seen mass demonstrations of support in Niger for the nationalist policies of this new government and opposition to the neo-colonial policies of France and the United States. France and the United States have tried to manipulate an African organization called ECOWAS, that is the Economic Community of West African States, and the Western powers are trying to use this organization as cover to provide multilateral marketing to essentially invade Niger to overthrow the nationalist government and to reinstall the pro-Western regime. ECOWAS, which is currently led by Nigeria, a Western ally, has made plans for a military intervention to send troops into Niger, and the organization gave Niger a deadline saying, on the 6th of August, if the military government did not step down and reimpose the pro-Western leader, they were going to invade. Well, what happened on the 6th of August? Tens of thousands of people in Niger filled the central stadium in the capital, Niamey, and held a mass demonstration of support for the nationalist policies of the military government, condemning the threats of foreign intervention. And by the way, an interesting fact, that stadium in the capital of Niger, Niamey, was actually built by China. It was not built by the Western powers who have exploited and taken so much wealth out of West Africa. Instead, it was China that has built significant infrastructure in Niger, one of the poorest countries in the world. These mass demonstrations are clear evidence of the fact that 
the majority of people in Niger who are known as Nigerians, not to be confused with Nigerians from Nigeria, these demonstrations reflect the fact that the majority of Nigerians do support the nationalist policies of this military government, as was admitted by The Economist, this Western media outlet that acknowledged that three quarters of Nigerians support the policies of the military government. However, while the Western powers and their allies in West Africa are threatening to invade Niger, that's much easier said than done because the reality is that many countries in the region staunchly oppose the possibility of a foreign intervention. The neighboring countries of Mali and Burkina Faso have said that they would consider this an act of war against them. The government of Guinea and also even Chad, a Western ally, have opposed the calls for military intervention. And the nationalist government in Algeria that came to power after a revolution against French colonialism also strongly opposes the possibility of military intervention in Niger. So the Western powers may want to try to launch a military intervention in Niger like they did in Libya in 2011 or like France did in Mali in 2013 and 2014. But the geopolitical situation is very different today. And there is a lot of opposition to these Western neocolonial policies. In addition to the vast amounts of gold that Niger produces, it also produces a lot of uranium, which is very important for European nuclear energy, particularly in France, a country where one third of electricity production comes from nuclear energy and a lot of France's uranium comes from Niger. And in some years, France actually produces more electricity using nuclear than it even does oil. So think about how important oil is geostrategically. Well, in some years, uranium is even more important for France. What is also not very well known is that Niger has significant oil reserves. And although right now Niger is not a major producer of oil, it has about a billion barrels of oil that have yet to be pumped. And it has been in the process of building an oil pipeline going south through the neighboring country of Benin into the Atlantic Ocean. And there is quite a bit of potential for Niger to become a regional oil producer. So we are talking about a region of the world where the people have been made poor by centuries of colonial and neo-colonial policies. But in terms of its natural resources, these countries in West Africa have a lot of riches that are being exploited by foreign corporations. And if the nationalist military governments can exercise more national control over these natural resources, they can help develop their economies and make their populations much richer. This is, of course, one of the main reasons why the Western powers are so angry about the military governments in Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso, despite the fact that as much as they talk about so-called democracy, polls show that the majority of people in countries like in Niger specifically support the nationalist policies of the military government. Now, one of the most popular policies of the new Nigerian government has been its calls to kick out the French soldiers that are occupying the country. France's major newspaper Le Monde reported on this, and it noted that a representative of the new military government gave a speech on national TV announcing that they had decided to denounce the security and defense cooperation agreements with France. And in particular, they wanted the French troops in the country to leave. And there are 1,500 troops, French troops in Niger, and there are also 1,100 US troops in Niger. Furthermore, Niger's ambassadors to France, the United States, Nigeria, and also Togo were dismissed by the new military government. Le Monde pointed out that until recently, Niger was the Western powers, quote, partner of choice. It was a very important Western ally. And now the new nationalist government is seeking closer ties with Russia in particular, which is one of the reasons the NATO powers are so furious. This is rather ironic because the neighboring countries of Mali and Burkina Faso also had 
coups led by nationalist military leaders that kicked out the French soldiers. And Niger actually became the country where those French soldiers went to. And this was reported on by the French state media outlet France 24. They noted, quote, Niger becomes France's partner of last resort after Mali withdrawal, after the nationalist government in Mali kicked out the more than 2,000 French soldiers that were occupying that country. And you can see in the photo in this article, you can see Niger's former Western-backed leader, Mohamed Bazoum, with France's president, Emmanuel Macron. And I'm going to talk more about Bazoum later. I'm going to look at interviews that he did, and it shows that he was essentially a Western puppet. I mean, he defended the French neo-colonial policies and criticized people in his country who correctly described France's policies as neo-colonial. France 24 pointed out that Macron was forced to withdraw French troops from Mali following a breakdown in relations between Paris and the military junta in the Malian capital, Bamako. And Macron said in a statement, quote, the heart of this military operation will no longer be in Mali, but in Niger, and perhaps in a more balanced way across all the countries of the region. So this is the French government acknowledging that Niger was the heart of its military operations in West and Northern Africa in the Sahel region. So Niger played a crucial geostrategic role for French neocolonialism. And as I explained in another video, which I will link to in the description below, Niger has also played a key role at the heart of U.S. military operations in Africa. The U.S. has one of its largest drone bases in the world based in Niger. The U.S. Air Force built this spending $110 million, and they still spend $20 to $30 million per year maintaining this base, which is extremely strategic for the United States. The CIA also operates a drone base out of Niger. So now that the French soldiers have been kicked out of Mali, and now that the Nigerian government has called for kicking out the French soldiers as well, it's likely that the U.S. soldiers, of which there are 1,100, are going to be the next soldiers to be kicked out of the country. And once again, this explains why Western powers are so furious. In fact, the U.S. government has been so concerned about the coup in Niger that it actually sent the second in command of the State Department, the notorious neoconservative Victoria Nuland, to Niger, to Niamey, the capital. And Victoria Nuland tweeted in, in an incredibly ironic, hypocritical tweet. She said that she traveled to the capital of Niger, Niamey, to express grave concern at the undemocratic attempts to seize power and urged a return to constitutional order. Now, anyone who knows the most basic facts about Victoria Nuland should be just laughing because Victoria Nuland is the mastermind of coups. Victoria Nuland was one of the key figures involved in the 2014 coup in Ukraine, which overthrew Ukraine's democratically elected geopolitically neutral President Viktor Yanukovych and installed a pro-Western puppet regime that vowed to join NATO. That coup that Victoria Nuland, as an undersecretary of state, helped to mastermind, that coup is what set off the proxy war in Ukraine between Russia and NATO that started in 2014. It didn't start with the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022. It started in 2014, and according to the United Nations, between 2014 and the end of 2021, 14,000 Ukrainians died, and they're almost never mentioned, in this low-scale war that accelerated to a whole new level with the Russian invasion, this new phase in the proxy war. Victoria Nuland was physically in Ukraine in 2014, handing out cookies to the people involved in the coup that overthrew the elected government. And there is a leaked recording of a phone call between Victoria Nuland and the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine in which they are discussing on the phone call who the future leaders of the Ukrainian government would be after the coup. What do you think? Uh, I think we're in play. Good. So uh, I don't think Cleach should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. 
I think Yatz is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tani Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week. Yeah, no, I think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay. Good. Well, do you want us to try to set up a call with him as the next step? So here we have the veteran coup plotter, Victoria Newland, a hardline right-wing neoconservative married to the godfather of the neoconservative movement, Robert Kagan, claiming to oppose a coup in Africa where the U.S. has backed dozens of coups. And by the way, Victoria Newland was recently promoted to the second in command of the State Department. She is now Deputy Secretary of State. The only person more powerful than her is Antony Blinken, who is also a right-wing neoconservative war hawk. These are the people overseeing U.S. foreign policy. These are the people who have supported coups all around the world, and now they're pretending to oppose a coup in Niger. And why? Well, it's because of the nationalist policies of the new government, and in particular, its increasing relations with Russia. This was confirmed in a press conference that Victoria Nuland gave on the 7th of August, and this is published, a transcript by the U.S. State Department. And in this press conference, Victoria Nuland pointed out that actually that her recent trip to Niger was her third visit to Niger in just two years, which is clearly showing how important this country has been geopolitically for the United States in its attempt to try to exercise more and more control over the African continent and trying to divide Africa from China and Russia. And she pointed out that Secretary of State Antony Blinken also recently visited Niger and that they're coordinating closely with Nigeria and ECOWAS to try to launch this military intervention in Niger to reinstall the pro-Western leader Bazoum. And she talked about the importance of democracy. But if you go down in the press conference, she said that in her meeting in Niger, she raised the so-called threat of Wagner, the Russian military group, the co military contractor. And she said, of course, I raised the Wagner and its threat to those countries where it is present, reminding them that security gets worse, that human rights get worse when Wagner enters. So here we have evidence that the U.S. government is pressuring Niger and other countries in Africa to cut their relations with Russia and, of course, also with China. That's one of the real reasons that the that the West is angry about these new nationalist governments in West Africa. It's not democracy. It's not human rights. These countries have long violated human rights with support from the United States and France. The reality is that this is a new Cold War and the Western powers, NATO, are trying to cut off relations between Africa, China, and Russia. And we see that it's not working. Now, earlier I mentioned a poll by The Economist magazine that showed that 78% of people in Niger support the nationalist policies of the new military government. I want to look at this article here because it is very revealing. It is titled, After Niger's Coup, the Drums of War Are Growing Louder. And I want to stress here that The Economist is a complete pro-Western mouthpiece. It pushes right-wing neoliberal economics. And in terms of foreign policy, it is very pro-war. It is very hawkish. It is extremely biased in the interest of NATO. It is extremely biased against China and Russia. The fact that they acknowledge the, this reality of popular support for the military government in Niger and by extension other West African nations that is very important because it shows that this is something that cannot be denied, even by what are essentially Western propaganda outlets. The article began quoting a vegetable seller, a very humble working class person in the capital of Niger, Niamey, and he was expressing strong support for the military government and opposition to the threats of foreign intervention. He said, quote, if they come here, we civilians are going to war alongside the army to defend the military. And he said ECOWAS, that is the Western-backed African organization threatening intervention. He says ECOWAS has weapons to attack Niger, but not to kill the terrorists. It's a disgrace. And this is a very important point because in addition to being very poor and exploited, its natural resources being exploited by 
foreign corporations, Niger has also been destabilized by Salafi jihadist extremist groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And after years of military support from France and the United States, these countries have been unable to defeat these Salafi jihadist extremist groups. And you have to really ask, why is it that the U.S. and France claim that they're helping these countries so much, but they can't defeat ISIS and Al-Qaeda? And one of the big reasons for this that we'll talk about later that the military governments have complained about is that in 2011, NATO waged a war on Libya, destroying the most prosperous country in Africa, destroying its government. It has not had a central unified government since then. It's been stuck in a state of civil war. And after killing the leftist anti-imperialist leader of Libya, who led a revolution, Muammar Gaddafi, the U.S. Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, in a live TV interview, she gloated, we came, we saw, he died. Yes, we came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> did it have anything to do with your visit? No, oh, I'm sure it did. Now, when NATO was waging this war on Libya, Gaddafi famously gave a speech warning, if the West overthrows my government, the Salafi jihadist extremist groups like Al-Qaeda are going to take over. And that's exactly what happened. And the Western powers flooded Libya with weapons, and they also flooded Syria with weapons, trying to overthrow the nationalist government in Syria. And what happened? Many of those weapons went directly to the hands of Salafi jihadist extremist groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, and they also went to neighboring countries, not only the neighbors of Syria, but also the neighbors of Libya into the Sahel into countries like Niger and Mali and Burkina Faso. So a lot of these nationalist governments have been saying that NATO, the Western powers, bear responsibility for the rise of these extremist groups like Boko Haram in Western and North Africa. And they have been saying that the U.S. and France have failed to help us defeat these groups. And that's one of the reasons they've looked to Russia for military support in fighting ISIS and Al-Qaeda. I'm going to go back now to this report in The Economist. It noted that many people have been criticizing the Western powers for failing to fight the, what, these terrorists. And ECOWAS is now threatening military intervention, whereas it could be fighting these terror groups. And this explains one of the reasons why there is so much popular support for the military government. The Economist noted that they filled a stadium with cheering supporters and then they symbolically beheaded a rooster that was painted in the colors of France, the former colonial power. Now, here's the very interesting part of this article in which The Economist, despite its bias, acknowledges that 78% of people in Niger support the policies of the military government. 73% say it should stay in power for an extended period of time or until new elections are held. Even more interestingly, a majority of Nigerians, 54%, say they do not support intervention in their country. And of those who do support intervention, so that is 46% support intervention, of them, half of them, that is one quarter of the population, wants Russia to militarily intervene in their country to fight these extremist groups like Al ISIS and Al Qaeda. Only 16% of those who support intervention, which is actually, I mean, that's only really 8% of the entire population, want a U.S. intervention. Only 14% want the African Union, that is about 7%, want the African Union to intervene. And only 4% who support intervention, that is 2% of the total population, want ECOWAS to invade. So... The Western powers are trying to push for an invasion of Niger that the vast, vast, vast majority of the population opposes. And this is even being admitted by Western mainstream media outlets. The Economist quoted a researcher in Nigeria who said, quote, the West can't afford to be seen as being involved, which is why France and the U.S. are trying to use ECOWAS to give multilateral cover to their attempted invasion of Niger.
Now, by the way, a quick note on this poll. It's just so deeply ironic because The Economist is accusing Nigerians of having so-called disdain for democracy, despite the fact that the so-called democratically elected leader, who is actually only elected by a tiny percentage of the population, is clearly very unpopular, so he's undemocratic, whereas the military government has the support of the majority of the people, which means that the military government is democratic. So calling them anti-democratic just shows the kind of propaganda we see in Western media outlets. But furthermore, I also want to explain something else very briefly here that can be a mis bit misleading because some people have been looking at this poll and been saying, ha, you see that China is unpopular in Africa. But that's actually not the case because the way that this question was asked, the question was, which foreign actor do you trust the most? So it's a superlative. You can only give one answer. So the majority of people in Niger, over 60%, said they trust Russia the most. However, that doesn't mean that they're anti-China. In fact, a lot of people who support Russia probably also support China because both of them have very similar foreign policy in Africa and both of them are closely allied. So it's fair to assume that many of the Nigerians who supported Russia also support China. The China number in this response only refers to the Nigerians say they trust China the most out of any country. Whereas it's fair to say that a lot of people who probably support Russia also support China, but maybe they support Russia the most of all. Whereas the people who say they support the US or France the most of all, well, likely if they support the US and France, they're very likely to oppose Russia and China. So I just wanted to point that out. The way that question was framed can be a bit misleading. And I don't want people to take this as evidence that supposedly China is unpopular in Africa. In fact, there have been a lot of there's been a lot of other polling done across the African continent that shows that overall Africa is quite popular because Africa has been developing infrastructure projects in so many of these countries, like in Niger, where China has been helping to build. They built the, the stadium and they're also helping to build an oil pipeline. And here the Economist points out that um, among ECOWAS members, Benin, Guinea, Bissau, Ivory Coast, Nigeria, and Senegal have all threatened to join in this military invasion of Niger to overthrow the nationalist government. However, Niger has allies. The neighboring nationalist military governments in Mali and Burkina Faso have said that if ECOWAS invades Niger, they will consider it an act of war against them as well, showing military support for Niger. Furthermore, Guinea has a military government that has also condemned ECOWAS and refused to impose the ECOWAS sanctions on Niger. And the revolutionary government in Algeria that came to power after a popular revolution against the brutal genocidal French colonialism in North Africa. Algeria strongly opposes an ECOWAS military intervention. And even Chad, which has historically been a Western ally, even Chad has criticized the calls for military intervention and opposes it as well. So what we're seeing is that there are a few pro-Western governments in West Africa that do support the military in in intervention, the invasion of Niger. But Niger does have a lot of allies or countries that oppose this. So if France and the United States think it's going to be easy to get all of these countries on board with the invasion, they are wrong. The Economist quoted Algeria's president, Abdelmajid Tebboune, and he said that Algeria is, quote, categorically against any military intervention. And if there were, were an intervention, Algeria would qu consider it, quote, a direct threat to Algeria. Nigeria had offered to serve as the tip of the spear of this invasion, sending troops into neighboring Niger. However, it faces a big obstacle. The Nigerian president asked the Senate to approve sending troops. And what did the Nigerian Senate say? No, they opposed the call by Nigeria's pro-Western president, Bola Tanibu, to send Nigerian troops into the Niger Republic.
So there is clearly mass opposition, not only in Niger itself, but even in neighboring countries like Nigeria, people do not want a regional war because if there is a military intervention in Niger, it would likely spill over the borders into countries like Mali and Burkina Faso, leading to a wider regional war. And the people of Africa do not want more war, which is what the Western powers have always brought the region, war and war and war. They want peace and they want economic development, which the West has not brought them over hundreds of years of colonial policies and neocolonial policies. Western corporations extract the natural resources of these countries, the gold, the uranium, the oil, and yet the majority of the population remains in poverty. Niger is one of the poorest countries on earth, and in fact, less than half of the population knows how to read. The majority of the population is illiterate. This is the brutal poverty these countries have been stuck in under neo-colonial policies. And meanwhile, France controls many of the economic policies of these countries by imposing the colonial currency, the CFA franc, on countries like Niger and Burkina Faso and Mali. That is why these military governments are trying to have a change, and that's why their nationalist policies are so popular among their people. Speaking of the brutal poverty in Niger, if you look at the country's exports, what are they? The top export in 2021, more than 70% of exports consisted of gold. Furthermore, other major exports include radioactive chemicals, refined petroleum, that is oil, and uranium. So the people of Niger don't see the benefits of these exports in fact, in 2021, Niger exported nearly $3 billion worth of gold. The entire GDP of the country that year was less than $15 billion. So this wealth is being just sucked out of the country. And Niger is a country where 42% of the population live in extreme poverty. That means they, they live on less than two US dollars per day. In neighboring Mali, the symbolism of this neocolonialism is even more extreme. In 2021, 96% of Mali's exports consisted of gold. We're talking about $9 billion of gold exported in a country where nearly 80% of the population, 78% lives in poverty, and 20% of the population lives in extreme poverty. So where is all that wealth going? the billions of dollars of gold exported every year. It's not going to help working class people in Mali. It's not helping to fight poverty. It's not helping to develop the country. It is going into the bank accounts of Western corporations and a small handful of elite oligarchs in these countries who get extremely rich. These capitalist oligarchs in West Africa, they get extremely rich while the vast majority of working class people in their country live basically on the verge of starvation. Once again, in neighboring Burkina Faso, we can see a very similar pattern. In 2021, 85% of exports consisted of gold. And this is in a country in Burkina Faso where nearly half of the population, over 40% of people live in poverty. They're not seeing the benefits of this massive mineral wealth that is being exploited by a small handful of elites. Now, speaking of the vast natural resources in West Africa, something that's not very well known is that Niger also has significant oil reserves. In the previous video that I did, I discussed how Niger is one of the world's leading producers of uranium and how important that is for European nuclear energy, particular French nuclear energy, and one third of France's electricity comes from nuclear energy. But I'm going to look here at a report from S&P Global Commodities Insights, which is a market intelligence firm titled Niger coup could jeopardize oil production boost. This report points out, quote, a military takeover in Niger, the latest in a string of coups to grip Africa's Sahel region, could jeopardize the African country's plans to become a significant oil producer and exporter. 
Niger, a key Western ally, emphasis on that, a key Western ally and security partner of one of the world's biggest uranium producers, pumps around 20,000 barrels of oil per day. That's not very much. And by the way, do you know who has been involved in building an oil pipeline in Niger? The state-owned China National Petroleum Corporation. And Niger has been building this pipeline with neighboring Benin to go into the Gulf of Guinea out to the Atlantic Ocean. And S&P Global points out Niger is on the verge of a long-awaited production surge with this Chinese state-owned company due to complete the 110,000 barrel per day pipeline between Niger and Benin. This will transfer Niger into a significant regional oil producer and exporter. The country is believed to be sitting on a billion barrels of crude reserves, according to the African Petroleum Producers Organization. The pipeline would be a game changer for Niger. Now, what's funny about this article is it quotes a former State Department official who is now working for a Washington-based consultancy firm, Agnès Bernard, and she warned that following the coups in neighboring Mali and Burkina Faso, quote, as the transitional authorities lean further into so-called authoritarianism and Russian influence, the governments abruptly nationalized the gold mines, pushing industrial giants out. This quote is so revealing because when they say industrial giants, they mean foreign corporations that were exploiting the gold in neighboring Mali and Burkina Faso. This is a former U.S. official complaining that the neighboring governments in Mali and Burkina Faso, the reason they're so-called authoritarian is because they want their gold reserves to go to benefit their populations. This is what they mean by authoritarianism. It's a country exercising economic control, national control over its natural resources to be used for the benefit of its population and not foreign corporations. So this, to me, summarizes exactly what is happening in West Africa. These are fundamentally nationalist movements that have popular support. They're called authoritarian, but as we saw, even as The Economist magazine pointed out, three quarters of Nigerians support the military government and its nationalist policies. So actually, they're more democratic than the supposedly democratic leader, Mohamed Bazoum. And I'm going to talk about him here because he really is what this so-called democratically elected leader of Niger, what he really was, was a Western puppet. And by the way, the talking point that Bazoum was a great democratically elected leader is also very much misleading. Th let's think about this fact for a second. Yes, there were presidential elections held in Niger. The first round happened in December 2020. And Niger has a population of 27 million people. Roughly half the population consists of children. So out of the 13, 14 million people in Niger who are adults, can you guess how many people voted for Mohamed Bazoum in the first round of the presidential election? Fewer than 2 million. And in the runoff election, the second round in February of 2021, just 2.5 million people in Niger voted for Bazoum out of the population of 27 million, out of the adult population of roughly 13 or 14 million. So we're talking about a so-called democratically elected leader who was elected by a tiny fraction of the population. The reality is that millions of Nigerian adults did not participate in the election. And clearly, Bazoum did not have significant popular support. That's why even The Economist magazine is acknowledging that only 27% of Nigerians want him to be put back in power. If you look at his policies, it's very easy to explain why. He was acting on behalf of the interest of Western governments and corporations, not on behalf of the Nigerian people. I'm going to look briefly here at an interview that Mohamed Bazoum did with the Financial Times back in May. So this was two months before the coup, and it's titled Niger President Defends French Involvement in the Sahel Region. The president of Niger has defended France's actions in the troubled Sahel region 
saying Paris has been the victim of propaganda and populist anti-neocolonial sentiment. So this is the leader, Bazoum, saying that it's bad to be against neocolonialism and defending the colonizer of his country that committed genocide in Africa. And he said, quote, this is Bazoum speaking, quote, it's true that French policy in Africa is not a great success right now. That's a major understatement, considering the majority of the population lives in poverty and doesn't have access to electricity. But Bazoum said, quote, but is it France's fault? I don't think so. France is an easy target for the populist discourse of certain opinions, especially on social media among African youth. So he's defending the colonizer. And... The article notes that Paris has been blamed for triggering the crisis in Libya, for failing to quell the jihadist threat, and for backing unpopular leaders. That's really an understatement. Libya is a neighbor of Niger, as you can be see as you can see from the map here, and Libya has been completely destabilized by the Western powers. The NATO war that destroyed the Libyan state unleashed these extremist groups all across the region, destabilizing the region. And now we see the consequences with the spread of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And the French and U.S. militaries have spent years intervening in Niger and Mali and Burkina Faso. And they have not been able to defeat ISIS and Al-Qaeda, which explains one of the reasons why countries in the region are looking to Russia to help support to fight them. In this interview in the Financial Times, Bazoum went on and he said, quote, its adversaries want to project an image of France as a neo-colonialist power. Some people stick to that cliche, which is not true, but which is very useful for propaganda. What is he talking about? This is objectively speaking true. France controls the monetary policies and currency of Niger. But of course, he was a Western puppet, which is why he's saying this. Bazoum downplayed domestic criticism of his decision to increase the French military presence in Niger. This article notes that France has a large military base in Niamey, which is the capital, and the U.S. has a drone base near the northern city of Agadez. And the, the Financial Times describes Bazoum as pro-Western, as having a pro-Western stance that has received mixed a mixed reception at home. So he was very unpopular. The newspaper noted that Bazoum has come to be seen as a key Western ally. It noted that Antony Blinken became the first U.S. Secretary of State to visit Niger in the country's history, underlining its growing strategic importance. And this is, again, one of the poorest countries in the world. And the most ironic quote that they end this article with, this was in May Bazoum said that there was zero chance of a military takeover overthrowing him in Niger. And of course, two months later, he was overthrown. As if that wasn't enough, Mohamed Bazoum published an article in the Washington Post, which is closely linked to U.S. spy agencies. It's owned by the billionaire oligarch Jeff Bezos. And this is basically his public call for the U.S. and France to invade his country. It's titled, President of Niger, My Country is Under Attack and I've Been Taken Hostage. This article is completely embarrassing. It just shows how much of a Western puppet he was. He wrote that rather addressing security concerns by strengthening their own capacity, the gov military governments in Mali and Burkina Faso employ so-called criminal Russian mercenaries, such as the Wagner Group, at the expense of their people's rights and dignity. So we see him saying, I, I'm against Russia. I want to be a good Western ally. He wrote in this article, in March, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken called Niger, quote, a model of resilience, a model of democracy, a model of cooperation. Once again, just prostrating himself before the Western powers. And here is another quote that really just shows why the Western powers are trying to put him back in power. Quote, in Africa's troubled Sahel region, Niger stands out as the last bastion of respect for human rights amid the authoritarian movements that have overtaken some of our neighbors. While this coup attempt is a tragedy for Nigerians, 
Its success would have devastating consequences far beyond our borders. And here, he's just once again showing how much of a Western puppet he is. But Zoom wrote, quote, with an open invitation from the coup plotters and their regional allies, the entire Central Sahel region can fall to Russian influence via the Wagner Group, whose brutal terrorism has been on full display in Ukraine. So once again, this explains why the Western powers have been trying to overthrow the nationalist military government and reinstall this Western puppet Bazoom. It has nothing to do with democracy. He only has the support of 27% of his population, according to The Economist magazine, whereas the military government has the support of three quarters of the population. Objectively speaking, Bazoom is the undemocratic one and the military government is the democratic one because it has the majority support of the population. But according to the West, democracy doesn't mean that. Democracy means allowing your country's natural resources to be exploited by foreign corporations, freeing the market, not nationalizing your gold, which is what the national governments, nationalist governments in Mali and Burkina Faso did, which is why they're called authoritarian. Or allying with Russia and China makes you authoritarian. So this is the reality. Niger has become a major point of geopolitical conflict. The West has tried to make it that. In fact, the West has been exaggerating Russian influence in the region. The NATO proxies in Ukraine have even publicly blamed the coup in Niger on Russia. There is no evidence whatsoever that Russia had anything to do with the nationalist military coups in Niger or in Burkina Faso or in Mali. Now, yes, they have wanted to have good, positive diplomatic relations with Russia. They have asked for support from Russia after the coup, but there's no evidence that Russia was behind this. And the reality is that Polls show, again, from Western media outlets, that these governments are popular because their anti-colonial policies are popular. And the reality is that Russia is seen as an ally in the global south of their anti-colonial struggles. And a lot of that goes back to the history of the Soviet Union. Because the Soviet Union supported the national liberation struggles all across Africa, all across Asia, all across Latin America. In my experience here in Latin America, living in the region for several years, I have seen a lot of popular support for Russia, especially among anti-imperialists, especially on the left, because of that history of the Soviet Union's foreign policy, and because still today, Russia does maintain an, a foreign policy of supporting global South nationalist movements, despite the very different government in Russia today. And Russia still is, for instance, in Latin America, closely allied with the socialist governments in the region that had anti-imperialist revolutions in Cuba, in Nicaragua, in Venezuela. So the reality is that in much of the global south, Russia is still very popular because of that anti-colonial history. And ironically, the Western powers, by exaggerating Russia's influence in Niger, what they're actually doing is making Russia even more popular in the global south. In fact, I want to briefly look at an article in a media outlet you're never allowed to read because it's, it's evil and taboo. It's been banned in the West, which is Russian state media RT. There was a very interesting article written by a, an Africa expert in Russia named Andrei Maslov, who is now at one of the top universities, the Higher School of Economics. He's the director of their Center for African Studies, but he's also closely linked to the Russian government. Andrei Maslov previously was the director of Gazprom's operations in Nigeria. Gazprom is Russia's state-owned gas company. And he did a very interesting analysis of the coup in Niger. And he pointed out that, you know, Western governments have been grossly exaggerating Russia's influence. I'm just going to read a few very interesting points that he made in this article. Russia has actually officially condemned the coup, which is a national, a natural consistent stance because Russia in general doesn't want to encourage coups because it doesn't want to, to have a coup in its own country. But he does point out that obviously Russia was not very sympathetic to the Bazoum government in Niger, this Western puppet. In July, Russia held a Russia-Africa summit, and there are 54 countries on the African continent. 49 countries were represented at the summit.
Only five countries in the African continent boycotted the summit, and Niger was one of them. Bazoum was showing how much of a Western puppet he was. So clearly, I mean, Russia wasn't sympathetic to him and, and is probably happy about the new military government. But there's no evidence whatsoever that Russia supported the coup. And actually, on the international stage at the UN, Russia actually condemned the coup. And this Russian Africa expert who's closely linked to the Russian government, he pointed out that statements by the chief of Wagner, Evgeny Prigozhin, they should not be taken seriously. He has expressed support for the coup. However, he pointed out that without support from the Kremlin, Prigozhin's resources in Africa are very scant. And he already has a history of trying to look more powerful than he really is. And obviously we saw with the Wagner attack on the Russian government that clearly Putin and Prigozhin are not on the same page. So the attempt to portray all of these progressive nationalist uprisings in West Africa as Putin puppets and, and you know, they're working for the Kremlin. It's completely ridiculous. It's, it's extremely exaggerated. So that's the situation that we're in geopolitically. The Western powers would love to portray all of these anti-colonial movements as Putin puppets because the reality is they themselves have a long history of supporting coups all around the world. In fact, the vast majority of coups in modern history were supported by the United States and the other Western powers to support their interests. And the majority of those coups were against the interests of the people. They were on behalf of the interests of large corporations, and they were right-wing pro-imperialist leaders. There have been a very few amount of coups led by progressive anti-colonial leaders in history. I talked about those in my previous video, which I'll link to in the description below, of people like Nasser in Egypt, Gaddafi in Libya, or Thomas Sankara in Burkina Faso. And today, many of the nationalist leaders in Niger, Burkina Faso, and Mali are looking to that anti-colonial history as their influence. And Western governments, which have spent, especially the U.S., billions of dollars trying to fund, you know, so-called color revolutions and regime change operations, they always project their own neo-colonial policies onto other countries. But the reality is that Russia is seen as an ally by these countries precisely because Russia is engaged in a proxy war against NATO, and the Western NATO powers are the colonialists that colonized West Africa and continue maintaining neo-colonial policies today. It's that simple. And the Western attempt to blame Russia and China for everything is simply projection of their own neo-colonial policies. On that note, I'm going to end here. I'm Ben Norton. This is Geopolitical Economy Report. Please subscribe on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. There's always a podcast version of every episode. And if you're watching the video on YouTube, please subscribe to help promote this reporting in the algorithm. If you want to support the reporting and analysis that we do here, you can go to geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support. There are several ways to provide support. The best way is you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash geopolitical economy. We are completely independent. We have no big donors. We have no institutional sponsors. We rely entirely on small donors from viewers and listeners like you. So if anything that you can provide would go a long way. I want to thank everyone who joined me today. I will see you next time.